Hi, uh, my name is William Thayer, and I'm talking about the COVID uh, crisis. I've made a series of videos on YouTube, and this one is on reopening Texas. So the COVID crisis, of course, everybody knows how bad it is. I mean, just when I started these videos, it, the number of cases was 500,000. Now it's 813,000. The deaths were 20,000, now 45,000. It means we need to take action. Now, I made a whole series of videos on this, and you can freeze frame those and go back and look at them if you're interested. This one is on the Texas plan to reopen the state by phases, okay? And I thought, hey, put up a, a picture of a Texas Longhorn. Now, I my son lives in Dallas. He's a research nurse at UT Southwestern. And he took me over to the uh, Texas State Fairground, and I saw one of these Texas Longhorns. My God, this guy was as big as a pickup truck. Unbelievable. Anyway, Governor Abbott has uh, got a plan. He's got three executive orders, GA 15, 16, 17. There's all the links if you want to look at those. What it is is kind of the situation today is that some things are open, some things are allowed. Gas stations open, drive through food, grocery stores, businesses that pose those risks. Parks are open, which is good. They're not open in California. Hunting and fishing, jogging, thank God, and bicycling. Okay, otherwise you go crazy. Not allowed. Restaurants, bars, gyms, and schools, and that's what we need to work to get open as soon as quickly as quickly as possible. Now on May first. Um, the committees that uh, Governor Abbott has set up will make recommendations as what to reopen, and they're anticipating their COVID cases going down. And it looks like that's a good assumption. Everybody's doing their part in Texas. They're being careful. The number of cases is going down. If you look at this graph, and I give you the link down below if you want to keep track of it, um, they're down to about 500 cases on April 19th. Now, if you draw lines to say, hey, where are we going to be May 1st, you can draw a whole bunch of different lines. You can take the blue line. You can take the red line. That's kind of, I'm, I'm thinking that those are the more probable things. And it looks like uh, around May 1st, they're looking for cases in Texas, new cases to be down to like 250 to 300. Let's hope that's the case and they can start reopening. Now, the green line is more aggressive. We get you way down. I don't... I don't think that's probably going to happen. But Texas is in a way better situation than New York. Poor New York is going through agony. Just a few days ago, April 15th, 11,571 cases. My God, that's as much as some countries. Okay, but at least it looks like the cases are starting to go down. But if I compare Texas to New York, Texas on the left, New York on the right, look at the left-hand scale, okay? Uh, the first thing on the Texas scale is 500. That's about the cases that they had yesterday or a couple days ago. And on the New York scale, it's 5,000, an order of magnitude difference. So it's going to be a long time before New York really gets to open up. Uh, I just compared the uh, top three uh, states by population in the United States, California, 40 million, Texas, 29 million, New York, 19 million down there at the bottom. And look at the cases. You can see that Texas has got fewer cases, so it's really in the lead to be the first major state to open in the United States. So hopefully it's going to go well. What I've emphasized in all my videos is that comprehensive testing is the best way to go. Now, we don't have enough test machines to do comprehensive testing, but if we put our resources on it, we certainly would. And that's what I'm going to suggest to Texas. You can do two things in Texas. You can take what I would say the current plan is, what I would call the passive approach. Okay, we can watch the COVID cases slowly die out and go down to maybe 250, 300 by the 1st of May and watch them go down slower during, you know, the month of May. Probably it's hard to get the, the cases down to zero. But you could also do something else. You could take the active approach. You could make COVID die because you don't let it hide. It's the asymptomatic cases that are the problem. And you can discover them, at least you can do a lot better job of discovering them with comprehensive testing. And that means 
testing every single individual in the state of Texas. And it, we're far from that. They, I don't even think have a million tests in Texas so far. I'm talking about 29 million tests. So another way to look at it is you can lock down 100% of the citizens in each phase that where you go down 14, case, 14 days with uh, declining cases. It's still restrictions on 100% of the Texas citizens. They can't go to restaurants, but progressively you get fewer restrictions. But if you could get to comprehensive testing in a couple weeks, you could probably identify the 0.1% of the Texas citizens with COVID and isolate them, treat them, of course. But then the 99.9% .9 can go back to work. They can go back to restaurants. So it's just, uh, you know, comprehensive testing is the way to go. Uh, what I would say is a, a goal ought to be 29 people, 29 million people test everybody in Texas within two days. And then you'd identify who had COVID. And you've got to keep the testing up, maybe not every two days, but there's got to be some repetition because the new cases will keep sprouting up. So what? how many machines would that take? Well, for all 29 million in a day with an Abbott machine that can do 120 tests a day, 240 test machines, 240,000 test machines. I think probably if you had half that many, 120,000, be adequate to test people in two days. And if you had half of that, it's four days, not as good, but you know, you could probably uh, do that. Now, uh, as far as getting test machines, what are Texas options? Well, they can order them from China. Okay, they can order them from the U.S. I think Abbott, I'm not sure if they make them in Illinois or Florida or Maine, somewhere, one of those three spots they make them. But I think you're going to have a tough time getting a lot of them. Okay, I think the third choice, make the test machines in Texas, is the best choice. And I wouldn't make just one machine. I'd go after a couple. Here's a couple that I think are pretty good. The Abbott test machine on the left, okay, five tests an hour. The Akula test machine on the right, that's two an hour, but it's much simpler to make. Look at, you're going to hold it in your hand. It's going to be really small. So if you make the choice to make your own test machines, you got to do three things at least. You got to have the parts, you got to assemble the parts, and you got to have the test sample or the test chemicals. So <clears throat> the parts would be made from plastic. You make plastic parts from injection molds. Okay, assemble. That's not going to be too hard because you don't have very many parts to assemble. The test samples on the picture at the left in the Abbott, the orange blue and white containers, they're the ones that con that contain the, the um, chemicals. And of course, you swab somebody's nose and you put that in the white container. Now, parts, I'm going to say the Abbott's got no more than 100 parts. Maybe I'm wrong, but gee, it's the size of a toaster. And look at the Akula on the right. Could it have 50 parts? Probably even less. So what do you do? Well, you get a hold of these machines, and there are Abbott's in Texas, I'm not sure if there is a cooler machines or uh, test machines in Texas, but I, the first thing I do is get some of these and I tear them apart and reverse engineer them. Then I try to get Abbott to agree to a license. Uh, maybe I'd even come up with my own design based upon Abbott. Or, you know, if I couldn't get Abbott to uh, cooperate, I'd go to Peter Navarro in the White House and say, hey, Defense Production Act, we want to produce these things in Texas. Okay, so there are a lot of options here. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't wait for anything to happen. I would start reverse engineering this today. Okay, get your hands on this, reverse engineer it. As the old adage goes, it's easier to get forgiveness than to wait for permission. And time is of the essence. So injection molds, not hard. It's pretty standard technology. Lots of people do it. The mold is over there. On the left, you're going to, if you had 100 parts and they were all different, you'd have to make 100 different molds. I mean, this is machinist stuff. This is not very hard, okay? Uh, my grandfather, uh, that's the picture at the lower right, uh, this was actually at a nail factory, but he was the head of a foundry, so he was using molds almost 100 years ago. That was in Pittsburgh, but I think they can do it in Texas. Okay, so I look, Ken... Uh, Companies in Texas make plastics. Well, I looked it up on Google, and 
Yeah, there's at least 20 companies. So Rico Plastics, I think, is making plastics for the COVID effort right now, like uh, boxes for intubation, okay, plastic boxes. Uh, if you look, innovative thermal plastics, that sounds like they can do the job. DFW plastics, they probably can do the job. Texas injection molding, yeah, that sounds like exactly what you're looking for. Okay, so I think I'm pretty safe in saying Texas can make plastic parts. That's not an issue. What about assembly? Even less of an issue. Okay, so Southwest Airlines are headquartered in Dallas. They've got a lot of their people there. How many of their airline mechanics, really first class people, how many of these really skilled people have been furloughed? All of them. Okay, the airlines are basically shut down. So these guys, these guys, they can assemble or take apart a jet engine. That's really, really complex. A, a, a machine that has 50 or 100 parts, this is child's play for them. And if they knew by assembling these machines that they'd get their job back sooner, that they'd get the airplanes back in the air sooner, I think they'd be highly motivated to do this. And additionally, in with throughout Texas, there's 200, at least, this is the top 200 manufacturing companies on the link below, but you got a lot more than that. Lockheed, Dell, Texas Instrument. There's even Abbott. <laughs> even Abbott has an operation in Texas. I don't think they're making Abbott machines, but they, they make something. And HP. HP makes printers. The printers have a lot more parts in them than one of these Abbott machines. you got people that know how to get the job done. So what would the assembly line for a unit that's the size of a toaster that has 100 parts look like? It kind of looked like a workbench or maybe even your kitchen table. I mean, this is not a real sophisticated operation. You could have 100 or 1,000 production lines with no trouble whatsoever. So my guess is that you talk to the plastic companies, they could be producing the parts within a week and just ramp up the production on that. Okay, and then by week two, it becomes a question of assembling. And you got a lot of talented, motivated people in Texas. Uh, I think you'd have 120,000 test machines sometime in May. And before that, you'd have 10,000, 20,000, 40,000. That would help you uh, make sure that the Texas plan to reopen stayed on track. Now, test samples, okay, that's what I call the chemicals. Uh, for the PCR process. And in a prior tape, I described the PCR process in very general terms and give some links for more detailed uh, description of that. But basically what you're looking for is enzymes, A, T, C, G. Those are those nucleic acids that are the building blocks of DNA primers, which is pretty much the same thing. Yeah, it's, it sounds like a big scary thing, PCR process, polymers, chain reaction. Oh my gosh. But my son did this as a pre-med student as a senior in college, he was uh, isolating uh, pieces of E. coli, okay, and then he'd replicate it and have a million of them. Um, the, all the people at the University of Texas that are in this area, Texas, uh, Rice, Baylor, SMU, Texas A&M, got lots of people in Texas that know what this PCR process is, so there should not be any intellectual void there. And I looked uh, <clears throat> for companies in Texas that produce <coughs> sorry, produce the reagents. Luminex in Austin, Texas does. So you got at least one company that does it. There's their link. The big oil companies, I think Exxon, Conoco, Valero, du and the chemical companies. <coughs> DuPont and Dow, they could ramp up production. There's the chemicals are the things on the right. Just You can look at the other link to do that. I've got one last chart here. This is on what Pfizer did during the Second World War because I think it should be kind of an inspiration for what the oil companies could do now because the oil companies aren't just oil companies. They're chemists. Okay, I'm my friend Dr. Ron Crossland worked for Shell Oil in Texas for 30 years and he's got three patents. He worked in polymers. He is a super brain and there's lots of guys like him in Texas. And... Um, they could they could uh, make these COVID reagents. I'm sure there's a little little bit of learning process, but they're pretty quick in the uptake. But here's what Pfizer did. The this the picture on the left is a landmark. It was an ice plant in Brooklyn, and they repurposed it to make 
penicillin during World War II, 1943 is when it happened. And I think those are the, the vats that they used. The deep vat process was the key for uh, making uh, penicillin on a mass scale. Uh, similarly, I think oil companies would be highly motivated. I mean, my God, the price of a barrel of oil is zero dollars today. Unbelievable. Okay, they want to get things back to normal. So would they be motivated to produce these COVID reagents? Absolutely. And is this going to be like a one-time thing? I mean, once you test everybody in Texas, is it over? No, no, no. You're going to have to keep testing until we get a vaccine. That could be a year. It could be two years away. So there's going to be a steady business in this. So whatever investment and time, people, machinery goes into this, you're going to get your money out of it eventually. You're going to probably be producing this stuff if you're an oil company and producing COVID stuff. You're going to probably be producing it for the world. Now, summarizing, Texas is the first major state to reopen, so let's keep it on track to be an example for everybody else. I'm sure their plan is going to be good when they announce it May 1st. It could be speeded up and it could be made more certain by comprehensive testing. Texas has all the resources to make its own test machines and test samples, both in terms of facilities and intellectual capability. Thank you very much for your attention and stay healthy.